chapter three is going to be taking kind of a overview look at analyzing the marketing environment. We're going to break it into two primary markets and then we're going to dig a little deeper and go into the individual environments. The marketing environment influences the development, the strategy, effectiveness, and distribution of a company's marketing messages. So what is the marketing environment? Basically, it refers to the actors and forces outside of marketing that affect the marketing manager's ability to build and maintain successful relationships with the target customers. What we normally see is the environments are basically broken into two general categories. It's either a macro environment or a micro environment. Now, the micro environment consists of factors closest to the company that affect its ability to serve its customers. Now, elements in the micro firm affect basically the company's performance and decision making. Even before deciding on a corporate strategy, businesses should carry out a full analysis of their micro environment. Businesses cannot always control everything in the micro factors, but they should endeavor to at least manage them. And we'll look at them in a little bit more depth in just a few moments. The macro environment, on the other hand, consists of a larger societal force that affects the micro environment. It sort of surrounds the company. There are six forces that we'll review deeper as we go through this lecture. And there are some little acronyms that you can basically create D-STEP is one of them to help you remember those six environments. Now, once in a while, you might hear the term macro marketing. Now, this is very different than the macro environment. Micro marketing is a study of marketing processes, activities, institutions, and the results of basically a broad perspective, sort of like looking at something within the nation. Now, this also includes the culture, politics, society, and economics interactions that are all investigated. It's marketing in a larger context than any one firm. Now, basically, macro marketing is a study of marketing decisions from a societal perspective. We're going to start with the micro environment first because that's closest to the actual company because most of these items are either things that directly interact with the company or are part of the company. All departments within an organization have the potential to positively or negatively impact customer satisfaction. In designing marketing plans, marketing managers consider the other departments within an organization. As a result, a marketing department works closely with departments like finance, purchasing, manufacturing, and extremely closely generally with R&D. Now, what they want to do is identify ways that each department can contribute to exceptional customer value. And exceptional customer value leads to superior customer satisfaction, which generally leads to increased revenues. All of these interrelated groups form what would be called the internal environment. With marketing taking the lead, all departments from manufacturing to finance to legal to human resources share the responsibility of understanding customers' needs and creating customer value. Suppliers form a vital link in a company's overall customer value delivery network. This is because suppliers provide resources needed by the company to produce its goods or services. Now, sometimes suppliers can control the success of a business because they wind up holding a lot of power over the business. A supplier will hold power over a company when the supplier is the largest supplier, or sometimes they're even the only supplier to the company of materials that are needed for the production of the organization's marketing offerings. In this type of supplier power relationship, the company, your company, the buyer, we will call them, is no longer vital to the supplier's business because basically the supplier knows that they're needed. They're needed because the other company can't be successful without the products and services that the supplier provides. So the more the supplier's product is core part of the buyer's finished product, the more power a supplier has over that other company's ability to function. 
most organizations will try to make sure that they have multiple suppliers for core products. As such, it's the marketing manager's job to make sure that those multiple suppliers are being able to provide things at a level that satisfies customers' needs. Additionally, supplier problems can seriously affect marketing. Marketing managers much watch the supply availability and the costs. Supply shortages or delay can cost sales in the short run and in the damage customer relationships in the long run. Rising supply costs may also force price increases, which can harm the company's sales. Overall, you have to think of suppliers as basically being part of the company. If you don't, then what's going to wind up happening is that you could have a issue that your customers will not realize is not caused by your company. If your supplier doesn't get their materials to you on time and you're late in shipping something, the customer won't care that it's the supplier, they'll care it's that it's your organization. Now you have some control over this because you can make sure you have multiple suppliers. Most companies do not make products that they sell directly to customers. As such, they're going to need a middleman. These are called marketing intermediaries. These intermediaries provide a way to get products from the manufacturer into customers' hands. They're an integral part of the supply chain. These are independent firms which basically assist in the flow of goods and services from producers to end users. Whether a company should use marketing intermediaries or not will depend on the scale of its operations and basically the costs of performing those tasks in-house that the intermediaries would perform. Resellers are a distribution channel that helps firms find customers and make sales to them. The two most popular are retail and wholesale. Retails directly interact with customers and are probably the most common example of marketing intermediaries. With retail, the customer has the benefit of being able to compare different brands of the same product and manufacturers benefit by having locations to get their products directly into consumers' hands. If you think about it, if you want to buy a TV, you tend to go to a store and you look at multiple TVs at the same time. If I was JVC and had my own store, then you may or may not be able to compare me to others. You wouldn't see my competitive advantage. In the older days, each TV manufacturer really did have their own stores. I can remember going with my grandfather to the RCA store one day, then the next time we went to Panasonic, and I can't remember who the third one was, but he was so tired by looking by the third night, he just went back and bought the one he had seen the first day. So there were many, many brands he didn't get to see. But in a retail store, I can walk in and see these multiple brands at the same time. So the manufacturer gets to have its product put up against its competitors for my decision as the consumer to evaluate and figure out which one has the best competitive advantage for me. Now with e-commerce, some market intermediaries are starting to become basically manufacturers. While it has become easier for even small businesses to sell products directly to customers online, it's also given many companies the ability to both be manufacturers and retailers. Of course, the biggest person out there right now is Amazon, but they only at first sold other companies' products. Recently, they've started to produce their own products for sale directly to the customer. Wholesalers are the other big resellers. They're independent businesses that buy goods in bulk from manufacturers and then resell them to retailers and other businesses. These types of intermediaries do not sell to the customers. They instead focus on satisfying the demands of retail and other businesses where customers will shop. Retailers use wholesalers for easy access to a product at a relatively low price. They also benefit from what we say time save by going through the wholesaler instead of directly to the manufacturer, where the time it takes to receive a good can significantly increase. 
Retailers that use wholesalers typically do not purchase their own products. They are instead buying other brands' products to sell. Physical distribution firms help a company to move its stocks from one point of origin to basically their destination. These distributors work much like a wholesaler in the sense that they play middleman between manufacturer and retailer, but there's a fundamental difference between them. Distributors do not purchase the product from the manufacturers. They just move the product, whereas wholesalers buy the product and resell it to retailers. Moreover, wholesalers' key customer is the retailer. Distributors essentially work for the manufacturers. Distributors are activities involved in promoting the manufacturer's products, however as well as selling them to retailers and wholesalers. Their job is more about just getting the product from manufacturer to retailer. They actively search for marketing opportunities and ways to expand the product and the brands that they are helping to sell. But again, they do not take possession of the product. One of the industries that you really see this happen a great deal in is boat manufacturing. Companies who build boats quite often will use another company to simply deliver the boats from place to place. But they need those people to bridge that gap because most boat manufacturers are basically not set up to make the deliveries of these large boats. However, that distributor does not buy the boat and then resell it to the retailer further down the road. Marketing service agencies are marketing research firms, advertising agencies, media firms, and marketing consulting firms that help companies target and promote its products to the right markets, basically. Lastly are financial intermediaries. Now, these include banks, credit companies, insurance companies, and other businesses that help with the financial tracks financial transactions, sorry, couldn't say that one, or insure against any kind of risk associated with buying and selling of goods. So we mentioned the boat a moment ago. Boats are very expensive in many cases. And so if I'm a manufacturer of a boat, I may not be able to wait for a customer to come and buy that boat. But at the same point, the retailer may not be able to buy the boat from me. So quite often we'll use financial intermediaries to help sort of bridge that gap until that million dollar boat can be sold. Those who sell the same or similar products and services to your organization is your marketing competitors. And the way they sell needs to be taken into account. How do their prices and products differentiate and impact yours? How can you leverage this to reap better results and get ahead of them? Marketing concept states that to be successful, a company must provide greater customer value and satisfaction than the competitors do. Thus, marketing must do more than simply adapt to the needs of the target customers. They must gain strategic advantage by positioning their offerings strongly against the competitor's offering in the minds of the consumers. No single competitive marketing strategy is best for all companies. Each firm has to consider its own size and the industry position compared to those of its competitors. Large firms with dominant positions in an industry can use certain strategies that smaller firms cannot afford. However, small firms can also develop winning strategies. Your organization has the duty to satisfy the public. Any action that a company makes must be considered from the angle of the general public and how they are affected. The public, on the other hand, has the power to help you reach your goals. However, the public can also can prevent you from achieving them. So publics are just basically groups that have some sort of significant impact on the marketing activities of a company. For example, satisfied customers are a public that contribute to the marketing program through positive word of mouth. Whereas customer advocates and watchdog groups, they're examples that 
of publics that could hinder your marketing activities through negative word of mouth. We have several here that we can kind of take a look at, although there are more than what I've listed. Financial publics basically influence a company's ability to obtain funds, whereas media publics carry news, features, and editorials. When we think about the government publics, here management must take the government development into account, especially when it comes to laws and regulations. There are citizen action publics where basically this group's questions consumers, organizations, and environment, and what the company is doing. Local publics include neighborhoods, residents, and community organizations. And then you have just basically the general public, and this is who the company is offering, or basically anybody who's what we would call a stakeholder who's affected by the company's activities. Now, the internal public we sometimes don't think about, but these are the workers, the managers, the volunteers, the board of directors, anybody who interacts with the actual company itself. There are five types of markets in which organizations can sell to. The consumer market consists of individuals and households that buy goods and services for personal consumption. Whenever you buy a product or service, you're part of that consumer market. We tend to break the consumer market down into four major types of consumer markets. We have retail, transportation, food, and beverage. Consumers, well, now they usually make their own decisions on whether to buy something being offered in these marketplaces. Second is the business market. They often call this B2B. B2B buy goods and services for further processing or for use in their production processes. So business markets refer to businesses that market products or services directly to other businesses. These other businesses will either resell that product or use them to make their own products or services. Resellers, we just sort of talked about. Reseller markets buy goods and services to resell at a profit. If you remember, we talked about that these producers or intermediaries are basically either retailers or wholesalers. People quite often don't think about the government markets, but they basically consist of government agencies that buy goods or services to produce public services. This is the largest single purchaser in the United States. International markets are just sort of what they sound like. They're basically consists of buyers in other countries, including the consumers, the producers, the retailers, and the governments in other marketplaces outside the US. Now that we looked at the elements of the micro market, let's move on to the macro market. Now remember the macro market, as you can see, is outside the company. Those other elements we directly interacted with as a company, but these elements basically float outside of us. We may interact somewhat with them, but we have very little control over the macro environment. Demography is a study of human populations in terms of size, density, location, age, race, gender, occupation. Basically, there's all kinds of statistics. I always like to say that demography has to do with numbers and people. Marketers will analyze several usually important factors that affect marketing environment and marketing decisions. The first factor is the changing age and family structure. The U.S. population contains several generational groups. This includes what you see in the graph below, the baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, also known as Generation Y, and the newer ones, Generation Z. Now, Generation Z, that name may not stick because it's a new generation, we do tend to see things float and change so we feel more comfortable. As Generation Y was Y until recently when it became Millennials. But you can say a little bit about each group on this chart. The second factor is the changing American household. More people are divorcing or separating and maybe even choosing not to marry at all or marrying later or marrying without the intent of having children. 
marketers must increasingly consider the special needs of non-traditional households because they are now growing more rapidly than traditional households. Each group has basically distinctive needs and buying habits. A third factor is geographic shifts in population. The population shifts interest markets because people in different regions buy differently. For example, people in the Midwest buy more winter clothing than people in the Southeast. I'm not quite certain I even own a winter coat, which would be considered a real winter coat up north because I live on one of the Bay Area Islands here in Florida. The one time I went up north, people sort of giggled at what they what I thought was a coat. They said it was summer wear. <laughs> now, four items such as educations can also help a company position their product more effective manner. As an example, the average income of people with different degrees is very helpful for marketers to understand their target market. And the final factor is the increasing diversity within the United States. Marketers face increasing diversity markets as the operation becomes more international in scope also. Some major companies also basically try to explicitly target different groups such as gay and lesbian con consumers. Now, mostly I've talked about the American market, but understand that if we are talking about an international market, many of the things that I described will still be there, but they're going to be perhaps different than the American market, especially if we start talking about the change in age. And while there was sort of a baby boom worldwide, it doesn't mean that baby boom occurred exactly at the same time. International marketing is getting to understand your different regions or specific companies or countries within those regions. Economic factors can have dramatic effect on consumer spending and buying habits. Companies have now adapted to sort of this back to basic sensibility in lifestyles that consumers are looking for. The spending patterns that are here today will probably persist for some years to come. Consumers are buying less and looking for greater value in things that they do buy. This happened pretty much after the Great Recession in 2008. Businesses have responded with what they call value marketing. Value marketing has become sort of this watchword for many marketers. Marketing in all industries are looking for ways to offer today's sort of more frugal buyers greater value. Marketers should pay attention to income distribution as well as income levels. Over the past several decades, we know the rich have grown richer, the middle class has basically shrunk, and the poor, well, they've remained poor. The distribution of income has created all kinds of a tiered market system. Many companies aggressively target the affluent, while other firms target those in the more moderate means. Still, even other companies tailor their marketing offers to a wide range of markets, from affluent to less affluent. Now make sure you understand that just because somebody is less affluent doesn't mean that you can't have a very successful company. Look at the success of stores like Dollar General or the Dollar Tree. They've been extremely successful and they target themselves toward people of less affluent costs. Things like Swab Shampoo also going toward less expensive or more frugal buyers. They're an extremely successful and very profitable company. The cultural environment consists of institutions and other forces that affect society's basic values, perceptions, preferences, and behaviors. Societies shape basic beliefs and values. You know, people grow up in a particular society that shape their basic values and values. They absorb a worldwide view that defines their relationship with others. Cultural characteristics can affect marketing decisions. People in a given society hold that many beliefs and values may or may not match certain core products. Their core beliefs and values have a high degree of persistence and are passed on from the parent to the child and are reinforced generally by schools, churches, businesses, and for the government. For an example, most Americans believe that we have individual freedoms and that you should work hard, get married, achieve, 
All of these things are needed to be considered to be successful. These beliefs shape more specific attitudes and behaviors that are found in everyday life. Secondary beliefs and values are more open to change, and they include people's views of themselves, others, organizations, societies, even universities. Believing in marriage is a core belief. Believing that people should get married early in life is what we'd call a secondary belief. Marketers have some chance of changing society values, but little chance of changing core values. Just trying to even define what technology is can be difficult as technology is always evolving. The technology that we use in the Middle Ages to build those huge cathedrals may seem very low in comparison to our much more modern laser cutters. But in that age, well, it was considered cutting edge. Yeah. I think often about my grandmother who was born before planes were even invented and she lived to see a man walk on the moon. The truth is that the entire course could just cover how technology has shaped the marketplace. I picked this particular definition of technology after looking at many of them because I liked how it wrapped up things in um, sort of a, a way in which it wasn't looking at just the production of products. It talks about how technology is interrelated to our life, society, and our environment. So what happens is that in a more modern society, we tend to think of things like cell phones as being technology. But we have to understand that a shovel is technology. A rake is technology. The invention of the fork was a technology. Technology is all around us. And what you need to remember is that new technologies can offer exciting opportunities for marketers. Many firms use right now these things called uh, radio frequency identifiers, RFIDs. And that technology tracks packages through various points in the distribution channel. I mean, they put them in the shipping containers. And when a shipping container falls over board, which unfortunately they do more often than you think, the satellites can literally pick up the shipping containers. We know that in some very precious cargoes, we can put GPS tracking systems so things such as expensive violins can be tracked as they move with the client onto airplanes and through other areas. New technologies create new markets and new opportunities. Companies that don't keep up will soon find their products are basically out of date. Now, we do also have to remember that government agencies investigate and ban potential unsafe products. Regulations have resulted in much higher research costs and longer times between new product ideas and their actual introduction. Marketers should be aware that these regulations, when they're applying for new technologies or developing new products and looking for new patents. Many of these regulations are out there but companies are not always aware of them, especially smaller companies, which may not have the legal departments to go and do the research. The Earth's renewal of its natural resources, such as forests, agricultural products, marine products, and such, must be taken into account by any organization. While the production of renewable resources is of concern to all people, Companies need to be especially watchful of the use of natural non-renewable resources as those also impact an organization's ability to produce its goods or services. These non-renewables will become even more costly for an organization to use as the source of these elements become less abundant. Now, there are four major types of non-renewable resources oil, natural gas, coal, and nuclear energy. Generally, oil, natural gas, and coal are grouped together and they're just called fossil fuels. However, it's really important to note that in the language of economics, non-renewables 
are resources that cannot be replaced at the speed in which they're consumed. That means that minor non-renewables include things like minerals and metals. And both of these are critical in many industries, such as the need for aluminum and steel in the production of cars. And mobile phones use 75 of the 118 elements on the periodic table for construction. We're basically not gonna be able to build most of our modern technology if we run out of the minerals and metals that are within the earth. So marketers should be aware of several trends in the natural environment. The first involves growing shortages of raw materials. Firms making products that require scarce resources face large cost increases, even if the materials remain available. The second trend is increasing pollution. This can become a social cultural concern and affects the desirability of the marketing offerings. Third trend is increased government intervention in natural resource management. The governments of different countries vary in their concern and efforts to promote the clean environment. Today, enlightened companies adopt practices that support environmental sustainability. Environmental sustainability refers to an effort to create world economies that the planet can support indefinitely. The political environment is defined as the laws, government agencies, and pressure groups that influence or limit various organizations and individuals in a given society. Business legislation has been enacted for a number of reasons. The first is to protect customers from each other. The second purpose of government regulation is to protect customers from unfair business practices. And the third purpose is to protect the interests of societies against unrestrained business behavior. Now, almost everybody will take a business law class, but let's just quickly go over some major legislation and its purposes that affected marketing specifically. The Children's Television Act of 1990 limited the number of commercials aired during children programs. Nutrition and Label and Educational Act of the 1990s requires that food products labels provide detailed nutritional information. The Telephone Customer Protection Act in 1991 established procedures to avoid unwanted telephone solicitations. I can hear you laughing because you probably got several robocalls today. But understand that most of those calls come from outside the United States and we don't have control in the United States of what other countries do. The Americans with Disabilities Act in 1991 makes discrimination against people with disabilities illegal. The Children's Online Privacy Act of 2000 prohibited online collection of information from children without parental consent allowing parents to review information collected about their child. The Do Not Call Intermediary Act collects fees from telemarketers who basically do not abide by the enforcement of the Do Not Call Registry. This may be also some laughter in the background. Please understand that when we talk about the Do Not Call Act, not all organizations fall underneath this policy. Political groups do not fall under this policy nor do many not-for-profit groups. The CAN-SPAM Act of 2008 regulates the distribution and content of unsolicited commercial emails. You may again kind of giggle about that, but again, we do have that within the United States, if you're a legitimate company, you can't simply send emails out without basically ask or giving people a way to unsolicit from that email. We do know that there are lots and lots of illegal activity when it comes to emails, but that's why this legislation is there. If you are a legal company working in a legal way, there are constraints on what you can and can't do as far as your email marketing is concerned. The Financial Reform Act of 
2010 created the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. It writes and enforces rules for marketing of financial products to consumers. It recently really stepped in for Wells Fargo when they basically kind of broke the rules. Now, there are many, many other laws that are out there. The laws that I talk to are basically federal laws. But you also have to understand we have state, county, city laws and ordinances. You really do need to take a good business law class to get a basic understanding of how laws basically are planned and created. But as an organization or company, you really have to focus on local laws, especially if you're a small company. People so much focus on the big federal and national races that they forget the small races are what affect the local business and the small races and who comes in and who comes out and their belief systems are what's going to create zoning. It's what's going to create business policies that you're going to have to follow. So pay attention, understand what's going on. And sometimes you have to wrestle with whether or not the laws that or regulations that somebody wants to bring in may personally help you, but they could negatively affect your business. I put together this little chart as sort of a comparison to end up this look at the micro versus the macro environment. Each one has a very specific area. And probably the biggest thing to look at is really the definition or what they look at. The micro is looking internal to the environment, what we interact with, where the macro is external. And also basically the amount of control. Internal microenvironment, of course, a company has a lot more control. And basically on the outside, there's very little control. That's one reason why companies do so much lobbying and other activities to try to help influence what's happening out there. I like to bring you quotes from different people, and this time it's Philip Kotler. He's an author of 57 different books and a well-known professor of Emirates of Marketing at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, considered probably the top school in the United States for business. He was the first recipient of the American Marketing Association's Distinguished Marketing Educator Award in 1985. He was inducted in the Management Hall of Fame in 2013. And if you look at what he's saying, it makes sense. And studying the micro and macro environment will help you get in front of your clients. Well, I hope we've learned a few things and I'll see you in the next chapter.